What will happen in Season 4 of Amazon's The Boys? Theories and predictions explored. So Season 3 of Amazon's The Boys has finally come to its conclusion, and if your initial reaction was, wait, what? Then we feel you, marvelous viewers, because that was us as well. Although we do have a bone to pick with Laz Alonzo, because he promised that we'd get the origins of Mother Milk's nickname for the show this season, but we never did. What we did get, however, was a surprisingly casualty light episode that kind of fit the predictions that we made in our episode and investigation video, and the season finale predictions video, both of which you can find on our channel. And while the climactic fight was, ironically enough, pretty anticlimactic, the ending specifically gave us an idea of just how dark season 4 is going to be, and if it's anything like we're expecting, then you guys are not going to be able to wait for it to drop ASAP. So, without further ado, this is what will happen in Season 4 of the Amazons The Boys All Theories and Predictions Explored. Oh, and before we get into our explanation, we have a very small request. If you like our content, please support us by subscribing to our channel. This is a small click for you, but for us it means a lot. Thank you, and, uh, spoiler warning. There's going to be a lot of them this episode. I'm not going back! What went down in season finale of season 3 of The Boys? Given the fact that Eric Kripke and co had given us surprise reveal after surprise reveal in the lead up to the finale, it's actually kind of disorienting that the episode 8 pretty much stuck to a rather basic storyline format. Well, sure, what went down towards the end can be called a twist, but we don't think so. But we'll get to that in a bit. For now, let's begin at the top. The episode opens with, as we predicted, Homelander taking Ryan from Grace Mallory albeit he did leave her alive, presumably because he didn't want to kill in front of his son, and every scene involving Homelander and Ryan feels wrong to us in the first place because, after all, he's a despicable egomaniac who literally thinks himself a god and views humans as vermin. But the amount of real emotion that Antony Starr brings out of these father-son interactions almost makes you want to root for the guy. Ryan is hesitant to talk to Homie at first because, while Homelander might have forgotten all about Stormfront by now, he hasn't and he still thinks that his dad is mad at him for accidentally killing his girlfriend. But here's the thing, Homelander only loved Stormfront as far as she served her purpose. As soon as it became clear to him that all she really cared about was that Aryan agenda, he abandoned her and only came to her to seek for his own birthday. Yes, she's an abhorrent Nazi, but her suicide does have a flimsy layer of tragedy attached to it, because she killed herself out of the realization that all he cares about is himself. And that is true in this interaction he has with Ryan because he only zones in on the family after he finds out that Soldier Boy is his dad. You can really see how desperate Homelander is to have a family and that is precisely where his views interest in Ryan's. Because unlike Stormfront, Maeve, Madeline, or anyone else in the world, Soldier Boy and Ryan are the only two people that Homelander shares a true relationship with. Blood is thicker than water and he believes in this phrase implicitly. And more than that, he is also painfully aware of the kind of isolation that Ryan feels because of his powers. Homelander grew up in a lab with doctors all around him and a set of powers too unstable to control for a toddler. In the comics, he killed every doctor in his birthing room with his laser eyes on accident, something that even M.M. acknowledges as being a mistake, because you can't teach a minute old baby right from wrong. Which didn't stop M.M. from killing a baby. And while Ryan hasn't done the same thing to anyone so far, he did kill Stormfront with his eyes by mistake, and that is something Homelander truly understands. He forgives his son that mistake, and threatens Grace to drop her phone before flying off of Ryan, where we don't find out now. The scene cuts back to Butcher and Huey at the Legends place, and turns out Soldier Boy let the cat out of the bag to them as well, before locking himself up in a bathroom with a bottle of whiskey and drinking milk cola to calm himself down. Like father, like son, eh? Or like son, like father. Either way, we're trying to say that Soldier Boy gave Homelander his creepy milk addiction, alright? Getting back to the point, Huey is concerned that SB over here is not going to play ball because Homelander is his son, after all. But Butcher is surprisingly convinced that he'll have no problems. He goes so far as to say that Homelander isn't really Soldier Boy's son, and he knows that. Something that he confirms at least two more times throughout the course of the episode with the boy himself. But we see him get on something of a redemptive path when he, Huey, and Soldier Boy stop at a gas station for supplies, because after telling Huey that he really is the spitting image of Lenny like his Aunt Judy did in Season 2, Episode 5, he knocks him out and locks him in a closet, effectively saving Huey from using the Tempe and risking death again. 
SB picks up on Huey's absence, but given the fact that he thinks the weed lad guzzles ejaculatory fluid for fun, and also the fact that Butcher assures him he has an in, he goes right back to sleep with a nary a care in the world. Which should tell you exactly what kind of a dad soldier boy would be, but don't tell Homelander that, because he has plans to win over Daddy Dearest. He does. Black Noir shows up at Vought Tower after making up his own mind to kill Soldier Boy, and he tells Homie the same thing, albeit with his signature visual aid. Homelander appears delighted at first and even hugs him, saying he knew Noir would be back. The Deep completely fails to read the room, as usual, but Ashley hurries him out of there because she knows exactly what is going on. And this is also probably the first time we see Noir's feelings towards Homelander, because when Homie hugs him, we can see animated hearts fluttering all over the place, showing us that Noir did consider him his best friend after all. But then he ends up dying at the hands of his best friend because he failed to consider just how important family might be to him. Oh, and also the fact that he kept his father's existence hidden from him for literally decades. There is an easter egg for the comic book version of Black Noir in this confrontation as well, because while Homelander recounts all the ways in which his existence was demystified for Big Homie, he brings up Noir's crooked old smile. And if you've seen the comics, you'll know that this was his permanent expression there. But Noir's death is, spoiler alert, the only one that occurs in this final episode, which is what has left us feeling so deflated because given the action that takes place later, they really could have given us more. But speaking of more, we find out that Queen Maeve has escaped from the armored truck transporting her away from Va and joined up with the boys. This is why Ashley and Deep went to Homelander in the first place. Maeve is just as shocked as we were when she finds out that SB is Homie's father, but she doesn't exactly agree with MM and Frenchie's plan to knock him out with the Novichok they've acquired for $10 million, or the price of three Bugatti Chirons, because Maeve is agrees with Butcher and wants Homelander gone permanently. So when the boys crash Soldier Boy's drunken reminiscing party, she chucks the bottle with the nerve agent outside the window and assists Butcher and SB in locking them up. The three depart for Vought Tower where we meet Ashley, the Deep, and A-Train all assembled in a room, waiting on Homelander for a meeting. Oh, before we talk about this particular instance, we should add that earlier in the episode, A-Train visits his brother Nate and gets kicked out of his house because Nate put two and two together, figured Reggie killed Blue Hawk, and he does not want to murder around his kids. Jesse T. Usher continues to win our hearts with nothing but pure facial expression as his anticipation turns to trepidation and then downright anguish in a space of five minutes. He knew deep down that he killed Blue Hawk for his brother's approval, but he failed to see that what he was doing made him no better than the racist soup. So, A-Train's redemption arc isn't your typical trope in a play, it's a realistic depiction of the consequences of vengeance, but it doesn't look like A-Train is going to stop there, because the reason that Homelander called for the meeting to even take place was because he wanted to send a message. He put Nora's helmet in front of the three, and when Deep inevitably asked him where Nora was, basically, you know, you can't read a room to save his life, Homelander simply replied that he was lying and keeping secrets from him clear implication being that they too would be dead if they crossed him. The Deep immediately goes into groveling mode and asks how he could prove his loyalty to his family patriarch, because that is what Homie sees himself as. But what he gets asked to do is literally tantamount to treason, and you'll find out why in a bit. But after Deep leaves and Ashley is made to reveal the consequences of her own disturbing condition, Homelander turns on A-Train, talks him down for killing one of his own kind referring clearly to Soups and Blue Hawk, but while Homelander continues ranting, we get a quick shot of A-Train sneak a peek at Black Noir's mask, which worked as a metaphor on so many levels. First, Noir was actually A-Train's kind, and that they were both African American men, and second, Homelander was nothing but a hypocrite, because he laid all that crap on A-Train after killing a Soup himself. The last shot we get of A-Train is him with a conflicted and frustrated face, and we think that it is going to come into play next season. But getting back to the good stuff, Butcher, Maeve, and SB arrive at Vought Tower to confront Homelander in a dramatic showdown that goes off the rails as expected. But not quite in the way we expected it to, because Homelander doesn't want to fight, he actually just wants to talk, for once. And it is here that Anthony Starr's best work as an actor comes into play because you can see the desperation for family and connection clear on his face. He even brings out Ryan to the shock of Butcher and introduces him to his grandpa confirming our three generations of Soup's theory. And, for a heartbeat, it does seem like Soldier Boy is going to team up with his family and take down the others in a bloodbath of a family activity, but surprisingly, Soldier Boy turns on Homelander instead and calls him an effing disappointment. And we have to give props to the writers here because they did hint at this all throughout season three. 
Think about it, Soldier Boy is a man from the 40s whose idea of a real man is drastically different from what we have today, or even Homelander had growing up in the 80s. Do you really think he would be proud to have a son who literally begs for affection in not so many words? I mean, he recalled the way his dad treated him and the statement he used to describe Homelander as a son is one he had heard his entire life himself. Even after becoming a superhero, his father only told him that he took a shortcut. This is a continuation of the theme of sons turning out like their fathers in this story. Butcher turns out like Sam, Soldier Boy turns out like his own father, and Ryan might turn out like his biological father in the end as well, and we'll get to that too. So, Soldier Boy tries to kill Homie, Ryan blasts him with his laser eyes, and he sends him flying away, calling him an effing little turd. And this marks as an odd turning point in our story because Butcher attacks Soldier Boy and is briefly joined by Homelander out of their individual desires to protect their son Ryan. Because, try as he might, Butcher can't make himself truly hate Ryan and he does care for him like a son, but so does Homelander, and we see his feral dad instinct kick in after he checks on Ryan and then goes to kill Soulja Boy alongside his arch enemy. That's when Maeve steps in for her own pound of flesh, and to his credit, Homelander tells her they'll finish their business after he's done with Soldier Boy, but she keeps hitting him so they end up fighting as well. Their fight is more evenly matched than even Maeve first thought. There's a cool Wonder Woman bracelets of submission homage when Maeve deflects Homelander's eye beams with her own bracelets. She manages to punch him hard enough to make his nose bleed, and actually manages to stab him in the ear with a metallic rod, but in the end, Homelander puts out her right eye and might have also killed her had it not been for the fact that Soldier Boy was about to go nuclear on everyone. Because while the Super X's were having their tiff, SB wrecked Butcher and was only stopped by the combined forces of Starlight, Kimiko, and MM, who managed to slip the Novacek mask Frenchie made onto him while confirming that Soldier Boy was indeed a racist. But the latter's PTSD went out of control and he was on the cusp of exploding everyone in the vicinity when Mav charged at him and jumped out of the window with him. The blast eventually left three entire floors of Vought Tower completely demolished, while the rest of the building lost its beautiful glass facade. With the fight concluded, Homelander leaves with Ryan in tow in a scene that directly mirrors the ending of Season 2, where Ryan chose Butcher over his own father. Butcher collapses on the ground after seeing this and wakes up in a hospital where he finds out he's only got a year to live, thanks to Temp V. And he joins the boys after helping a depowered and one-eyed Maeve hide and recuperate enough to seemingly ride off the sunset alongside Elena. And a later shot of Ashley deleting the footage of Maeve's survival also seems to confirm this happy ending for Queen Maeve. But we'll see how that holds up. The penultimate scene of the episode, we see the Deep's loyalty task was to kill the current prospective Vice President of the USA so Victoria Newman could take his place as Dakota Bob's running mate. And in the final scene of Season 3 of The Boys, we see Homelander arrive at the protests that have been running since Annie leaked his homicidal side to the media in the last episode, but to meet the Storm Chaser faction instead of the populist one. A rebel Starlight fanatic throws something at Ryan and calls Homelander an effing fascist, and before he has time to think, Homie just straight up lasers him, but rather than getting persecuted for this very public murder, perhaps the first in the view of American civilians, Homelander gets cheered by none other than Todd, and we hear the same ominous violin music that cues up every time Homie is literally losing his mind. Except this time, the camera pans in on Ryan, and we see a faint smile on his face as the screen cuts to black. How does this set up season 4? Well, let's break it down, shall we? Birthday, Homelander. Thank you. I can see you girded, you disgusting fat fuck. A-Train might become the last mole for the boys and suffer Queen Maeve's comic book fate. Every fiber in A-Train's body must be churning at the sheer pile of human agony that he has become. All of us started off the boys hating this guy's guts and lumping him with the likes of Homelander, but it's been three seasons. We don't feel nearly as much sympathy for Homelander as we do for A-Train as the audience. Because at least A-Train can make an effing apology. Homelander went on a televised rant about how he can't be wrong because he is simply better than puny humans, whereas Herogasm showed us that A-Train at least has enough humanity left in him to recognize his mistakes, however late he may be to the party. But we see that even his most redemptive act, killing Blue Hawk, a legitimately problematic soup, is tinged with the umpteenth amount of personal anguish. Because not only is A Train alive thanks to Blue Hawk's heart, his brother Nate, the only reason he even recognized morality in the first place, now hates him for being a murderer. It's a reality check that would have sent Reggie spinning into a rage and accusing Nate of being stupid enough to provoke Blue Hawk or something if this was season one, but A Train simply left his brother's home after being told to leave. And let's not forget that the look he gave Homelander when he saw what he did to Black Noir. Here's the thing. 
Racial commentary might not have started out as a serious motif when the show was pitched, but it is taking center stage in the story at this point, and that means that the black community will eventually need a suit to represent them too on screen. Homelander has already because the alt-right poster boy in the show whether he knows it or not. He just cares about the people who love him, whereas A-Train is being put through the ringer and really being made to understand the weight of what it means to represent the hopes, wishes, dreams, and fears of an entire community by being constantly denied the praise he so clearly longs for. But where A-Train in Season 1 would have just swallowed your moral accidentally whilst killing you for disrespecting him, Season 3 A-Train is taking the hits on his chin and managing to stand his own ground. Here's the other thing. In the comics, the boys didn't win because they managed to blow up the Seven. They won because they got the C-words on tape. Queen Maeve was the person who they used for this in the comics. She bugged the Seven's HQ out of the wazoo, and the boys were able to leak all that info to the public and turn popular opinion against Homelander, thereby prompting his killing spree and coup plot to come into being. But Maeve is gone now, and Huey already tried blugging Vought Tower in Season 1. That didn't work out so well for him, and he ended up killing Translucent to make up for it. So the role of being the final mole could very well go to A-Train now. He already has an in with the boys, and his relationship with Starla and Huey, though tenuous at best, hasn't always been uncooperative. He brought them the Stormfront files and helped expose her in Season 2. Planting bugs in Vought Tower would be a piece of cake for the fastest man alive, especially now that the entire crime analytics department is just the deep. And he could also suffer the same fate as Mae from the comics because while well, she got something of a happy ending with Elena in this episode, in the comics, Queen Maeve died trying to protect Starlight from a homicidal Homelander and got her head plucked off her shoulders as recompense. Homie didn't even flinch while doing this. He simply informed her that her sword was a metal prop and proceeded to dismantle her with ruthlessness. If A-Train is caught installing the bugs or he comes into Homelander's crosshairs by mistake, it's game over for him because we know Homie is at least as fast as him, if not faster. For reference, go watch the season finale of The Boys Presents Diabolical. Double final homework for you guys, but that being said, it's pretty much guaranteed that A-Train will die in the next season given just how unhinged Homelander has become. The only question is how. Oh, sometimes, well, these things just happen. Vic the Veep is either going to help Homelander stage the coup or expose him, leading to the coup. It was great to see Vic the Veep make his debut on the show finally. We're only kidding, of course, but seeing Victoria Newman step into the spotlight that was bestowed upon her frankly oafish comic book counterpart was the piece of the puzzle that we needed to enter the endgame. Because if you haven't read the comics, the entire Homelander coup conspiracy started at Herogasm, which also attended by Vic the Veep. And do you guys want to guess who this president was? We'll give you a hint, it rhymes with Lakota Rob, but how is that relevant to this video? Well, you'd think that the character currently on track to becoming the first female president of America in the Kripkeverse would need a way to get there, and that's where Vicky comes into the picture. We've drawn a lot of parallels to the comics, so let's step away for a second and look at two things that make Victoria Newman different from Victor Newman. One, Victoria is a soup, more specifically the head-popping soup, and two, she isn't nearly as stupid as her comic book counterpart, which she proves by making this play for vice presidency. You'll recall that in the previous episode, Vicky turned up to Homelander with a piece of paper that we now know had Ryan's address on it. She told Homie that all she wanted was a transactional relationship, and turns out his end of the bargain was assassinating the vice president of the United States, which makes sense because Victoria Newman is the embodiment of a ruthless politician. She got her adopted father locked up just to serve her own interests, so make of that what you will. But we have a sinking feeling that Vic won't remain the Veep for too long, because if her Senate head-popping fiesta has anything to go by, then all she needs to do is bide her time and assassinate Dakota Bob at the right place and right time, she will become the strongest person on Earth, politically, of course. As the next vice president. From here, there are two ways in which things can go. One, Vic plays Homelander like a fiddle and risks imminent destruction as a result. Or two, she gives him the keys to the kingdom by signing over executive power to him in an unprecedented political disaster. There is a third possibility, of course, and that is Homelander simply kills her and takes over the White House by brute force. But that only worked out in the comics because he rallied enough of the soup community into backing him. We haven't even seen that many soups in the TV show in the first place, 
so a coup being carried out by a group of soups is highly unlikely. What is likely is that Eric Kripke and his talented actor friends give us their own rendition of January 6th. Maybe use footage from that black day as well. And the mob that Homelander's rantings gathers is what enables the coup. The showdown between him and Vicky will be a short one, rest assured, but what we really want to know is, are the showrunners willing to cross that line and give Vicky the same ending as her comic book counterpart? Because that, ladies and gentlemen, would be disturbing to say the least. But either way, she will be the reason that Homelander is able to even get into the White House in the first place, and you can quote us on that. Butcher will become the final antagonist of the series. This was pretty much confirmed by the way Huey told Butcher that he wanted him to pull a Lenny and save Butcher from himself, because if you've read the comics, you'll know that Huey says these exact lines, minus the Letty bit, to M.M. Frenchie and the rest of the boys just as they figure out that Billy's true plan has been all along. Because while he wants us to think that revenge is the only thing on his mind, it's far more than that. In Season 3, Episode 4, right before Maeve and Butcher get it on, he tells her that his problem isn't really Homelander, it's soups in general. This is perhaps the only time we've seen Billy's full conviction, and it is scary, because he doesn't even appear this convinced of something even when he saves Huey from the Tempe, because what he did there was an admission of guilt in effect. Mindstorm's nightmare visions had essentially made Butcher realize that he did view Huey as his little brother, and he therefore felt somewhat responsible for him. But the, you've all got a bloody go, he said to Maeve was the real him. And we know this because in the comics, right after he kills Black Noir, Butcher also kills 150 other soups using a special variant of Compound V that makes the target's head pop. Homelander dies in issue number 65, and the boys has 72 issues in total. Those last seven issues have Butcher as the main antagonist of the series, and there are more than enough hints that his live-action counterpart will end up following the same trajectory. Who puts Butcher down in the end is a question that remains unanswered simply because there are so many possibilities at this point. It could be Huey, it could be Ryan, it could even be Annie. But the point here is that Butcher will eventually go after every soup in existence, and it might even start out with Kimiko, because she's the closest to him physically. He might even pay Maeve and Elena a little visit at their prospective farm, mirroring what Butcher did to Love Sausage in the comics, where the latter was a longtime ally of the boys and ended up dying because he figured out Butcher's true intentions. And if you guys think that he is going to turn his life around, then you guys are not as into the show as we are, probably, because they showed us Butcher's cancerous diagnose for a reason. The maximum amount of time he can live for is one year, according to the doctors, and in that entire calendar year, Butcher needs to get his affairs in order. It will start with Victoria Newman, move on to Homelander, and then the rest of the soup community before Butcher himself is either killed by a person or the cancer. And as we all know, Butcher doesn't leave loose ends, which is an ill omen for pretty much anyone who meets him in the series, including little Nina. <laughs> Huey and Starlight become mentors to a new generation of heroes with Ryan at the helm. Our final prediction is that at the end of Season 4, Huey and Starlight will become the ones who will usher in a new era of soups and actually show them how to be heroes for a change. And there is some foreshadowing for this in the form of Red River Institute, because if you take a cursory glance at even infant toddler soup we've seen so far, their powers have shockingly similar features to the Seven. Teddy Stillwell is a speedster, like A-Train, and Ryan is basically Homelander 2.0, except he might be way stronger than him. It's not too far of a stretch of the imagination to guess that someone will try to take control of these cute little living weapons of mass destruction after Va invariably collapses, and that someone might just be Huey and Annie. Starlight's entire character arc has been about being a hero and teaching others how to be one themselves. It would make a lot of sense for her to become the mentor figure of a team of soups who now know how to differentiate between good and evil for a change, and we don't say this because we think the world needs superheroes. Not at all. On the contrary, we agree with Butcher when he says that soups are too dangerous for society. But here's the thing, once something as revolutionary as Compound V is revealed to the world, there will always be people out there who will try to replicate it. We saw this kind of domino effect most notably in Iron Man 2, when the entire world started to replicate Stony Tark's armor because it was quite literally the best weapon a soldier could ask for. Well, if you swap out V for the armor, you'll have pretty much the same scenario unfolding in the TV show 
show as well. And not to mention, it is possible that only Homelander was involved in the distribution of V to Terrace as A-Train's role as an accomplice is under doubt from Jesse T. Usher himself. But the point is, now that Vought had let the cat out of the bag, the world will never be the same. And to protect this new world, a new team will be required. Who better to guide them than the two people who know how tough it is to stick to your guns when the entire world tells you to throw morals away? Marvelous Verdict You might have noticed that we have spoken about these four major predictions in rather certain terms, but that's only because we think the next season of The Boys will be the last one. And that isn't because we've got an insider scoop or something, far from it. We say this because the trajectory of the show presents it to us in such a way. So far it has been impossible to tell how far along the way we are in the story if you are simply a comic book fan because the chronologically has been jumbled up quite a bit. The comics has a lot of stuff the show doesn't, out of necessity of of course, but the order of events is also jumped to such an extent that it makes it unpredictable to guess where the story will go from here. But the fact that Newman is running for VP and that Homelander got cheered for essentially committing a blatant war crime on domestic soil tells us that the boiling point is coming pretty soon and the kettle might tip over finally in the next season. Sure, Eric Kripke can stretch it out for two more seasons, get to that neat 40 episode mark, but The Boys has always been about giving the fans what they want not just how they expected it. So dig your trenches and strap in for a long, long wait, you guys, because if Varsity drops next year, then it is possible we might not even get a season four in 2023. But till then, we will be waiting right here, keeping an eye out and both ears wide open. And as always, if you liked our content, don't forget to leave a like and subscribe to us if you haven't already. Have a good one and be safe. Thanks everyone.